Hey, it's Dan the Real Estate Guy coming to you from the home office. I have an update on the short sales. Remember, a short sale is when a borrower is basically selling their home for retail value, usually through an agent. Let's say they owe $400,000, the property is worth $225,000. They may be presenting an offer to the bank of $220,000 to $225,000, but they're offering them whatever's left after the commissions, the closing costs, and any other expenses to get that transaction done. They're offering whatever is left as payment for that $400,000 loan, as payment in full. It's very difficult to do. Um, you might remember from the short sale video, in my area, I think no more than one in 10 is actually successful and gets closed. Um, there's no hard numbers on that, um, but I'm watching all the, the raw data and that's what it looks like to me. It's very frustrating for the agents, very frustrating for the buyer, but once in a while a buyer finds a home that they're willing to fight for. Perhaps it's you know around the corner from a relative they want to live close to, perhaps it's a school district that they have to be in. Um, maybe the property they feel is just perfect and they'll fight the battle to get them closed. They often take four months, five months, six months. Most of them don't close. So not all buyers want to be in escrow for that long and not get the house anyways. You know, the odds are stacked up against them. But it's still good to get an update and remember what we do in our numbers. If you watch the numbers video, I like to watch the numbers. It's fascinating to me that the short sales have become a bigger part of our market, yet there's really not that many more getting approved as a ratio. There's just more of them. You know, for example, uh, a few years ago, uh, short sales represented maybe 12% of our market, maybe 14% of our market, somewhere in that area. Well, today I just took a look in a multiple listing service, and right now 52% of all active listings, actively for sale, listed in multiple listing, 52% are short sale listings, hoping to get a buyer that will fight the battle. That, uh, hoping to get a lender that will approve the sale and close. And we know the odds are against them, but that's half of our market, more than half of our market. We have 8,735 homes for sale, active, and we have 4,579 of those are short sales. They're trying to get it done. They're trying to give the bank less than what's owed. In the pending category, um, there's 2,407 pending sales right now. People in escrow trying to buy a home and some folks trying to get out of them. And uh, of those, 27% uh, or 649 units, 27% are people that are trying to sell a short sale or buyers are trying to buy a short sale. So 27% of the pending sales, they won't all get approved, but 27% of, the, of them are uh, trying to, all right? 27% of our pending sales. In the close category, remember, I like to watch that 30 days. What has closed? How many units, how many properties have closed? in a 30-day window because that's what's going to make me nervous if the market slows anymore. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to, but nobody knows the future, so I watch that number closely. You might remember from some of the other videos, in my greater Sacramento area, that number dropped all the way one month to 264 closings in one month in this entire area. That's very few. It made it difficult for me to sell properties in the 90s when I bought that 150 properties. It got difficult to sell them I moved into the units, which made it probably was the best thing that ever happened to me. Forced me to buy units and create cash flow. Um, widen the game, you know, buy and hold versus buy and sell. Remember, you're a small business. You can make a, a turn on a dime, right? You can turn quickly. You're not a big company that needs to make big decisions and take six months to turn their uh, direction, you know? So, interesting that right now we have over 1,500 closings still. Remember, that's the number I'm watching. It's still above 1,500 for each 30-day period. If that number drops below 1,000, I still really won't be too nervous. Remember, I'm trying to be one, two, or three of those per month. So if you have 1,000 homes selling a month, can I be one, two, or three of those if I'm providing the best product at the best price? And the answer is yes. You know, um, I was getting it done even in the 90s, but with those low numbers, I decided to switch into holding on to some units and creating cash flow. And that's what led to buying the large apartment complexes, so it was a good decision. All right. But in today's market, I can still move the product. Um, and I'm uh, looking at these numbers saying, hey, if it's above 1,500, we're in pretty good shape. A hot market, to give you an idea, would be 2,000 to 2,200 units closing per month. So we're not way off the number. I did review last year's numbers, and there were some months last year that were over 2,000. So the market's strong for a couple of reasons. Uh, really, it's the low prices and the really low interest rates. You combine those things and it's hard for a buyer not to buy. So anyone who can fight the battle and get a loan, they're difficult to get. But if they've got decent credit, 
good job, good employment history, they probably can fight the battle and get the loan. All right, there's plenty of sellers like me that would credit them for the closing costs. So, I mean, they don't need a lot of money to get into a property. And I think anyone who buys a property in today's down market using today's low interest rates is going to be quite happy with themselves over the years. They're going to feel like a genius someday, right? But uh, really, really strong for a buyer right now to get out there and get it done. All right, let's look more at these short sales. You know, the number that are getting accepted, I don't have any hard facts on that, but it still doesn't look like any more than one in 10. Um, how many um, uh, or which lenders are best to work with? It's hard to say, but there are a couple of standouts. Um, the ones that used to be IndyMac, which are now One West, uh, those are good. Wachovia, which is part of Wells Fargo, I guess, at this point. But watch for those if you're trying to negotiate a short sale. If you have any other lender, you might be wasting your time. Now, even when you have these lenders, you have to be concerned about a second lender because they got to get them to sign off. They're going to have, the first lender is getting less than what he's owed, but he's going to have to give up something to the second. You know, otherwise the second's not going to sign off on the deal and the deal's not going to close. That might be another reason why so few do get approved. You might have scenarios where the first says, hey, it was a $400,000 loan. You're offering me $200,000 net. I'll take it. But there was a guy on there with a fifty dollars or $100,000 second, and that guy's saying, hey, I want something, you know? Um, and so they have to give them something. So if the first isn't willing to give some of that cash when they're not even being made whole on their loan to begin with, they're losing a lot of money. But they need to give up some of that to the second to get them to sign off on the transaction and let it close. Otherwise, it's going to go to foreclosure. Now, you'd think a second would be a little bit negotiable, and they are. They're taking very, very small amounts uh, in comparison to what they're owed. But if the, if the second you know, stands fast and doesn't let the deal go and it goes to foreclosure, the second's going to get zero, no money at all. Remember, if you looked at the overview on the trustee sales, if that first goes to sale at a trustee sale and somebody buys that or it goes back to the bank, either way, even when it goes back to the bank on the first holder, the second's wiped out. They get zero, not a dollar. All right? But yet, some of them still won't negotiate. They, they just take their chances, apparently. Um, doesn't seem like a smart play. And today I talked to an insider, someone who uh, works with and for, and I think is even part owner of a company that negotiates short sales every day. All right? He's met some of these people behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, he's not impressed. All right, let's just put it that way. I won't say what he said, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's insider information. I don't think he expected it to get blasted out on the internet. So I'm just saying that they're not going to be all that cooperative. There's going to be some short sales that close. It hasn't changed a lot. Another big question for this video is, can an investor buy a short sale and hope to get a price negotiated low enough to where he could make a profit? And I would say the answer for this area is no. You might be able to get a little bit below market, but not enough to make a profit, right? If you're going to hold it as a rental, maybe it makes sense, right? But in other parts of the country, I am hearing that they can sometimes get them below market. So if this is an area that you think could be profitable for you, you know, when you look at all of our methods, we have over 15 methods now. I think we're at 16 or 17 that I've used over the years. Um, if you like the short sale, you think it's a pretty good part of your market, maybe you should check with a realtor, check with a short sale expert. I'm sure some people around there in your area are advertising as such. Find out if they are. Find out what percentage of your active listings are short sale. Find out what percentage are pending sales and closed. Find out if any deals are closing below market. It's not hard to check. They can help you check that in the multiple listing. All right. Find some short sales, maybe randomly check 10 in an area that you would consider buying and selling in. You know, the bread and butter properties. If you haven't watched that video, do that. But check that. When they run a, a CMA and you see a low closing, was it short sale? If the answer is yes, it's worth poking at that area to see if you can get one. All right. Now, even if you check it and the answer looks to be no for you, remember to recheck it every so often. You just built a relationship with a short sale expert, if, hopefully. Um, let them know that you need to buy below market. After all, you're trying to provide a good product to the market and be paid for it. So you need to get it a little bit low. If they notice that the lenders start to become more negotiable, they should contact you. You see, start building that network. These will become available. Very likely, these will become available soon. 
depending on your market, depending on the supply and demand, depending on who the lenders are and whether or not most of them are financed with a first and second loan, all those things come into play. Um, but you just need to be aware. You need to poke at these different methods from time to time. I'm testing all of them in my area from time to time. Remember, right now I'm using two main methods. Um, a third one looks like it's going to happen. When they do happen, for all you members out there, there's going to be an alert. You're going to know that that technique is back in play in my area and how to test it for your area. So you can kind of be on the leading edge. Grab some of those transactions before the rest of the investors in your area figure it out. Alrighty, a couple last questions I had for this expert are is, uh, and you might find this interesting, are they still asking sellers to sign a note? You see, some of these lenders, after they approve the payoff of the loan, they're not considering it paid in full. They're asking the short sale person, the person who got rid of the house, maybe they uh, paid 200000 to the lender on a $300,000 loan or something. Sometimes that lender is asking them to sign an unsecured note, 40, 50 grand that they will pay off. Maybe the entire difference, but that's not likely. They're not likely to get people to agree to that. But they're asking for something. And they're asking them, it's unsecured, it's not secured against a property, the property is sold. They're asking them to continue to pay. And I asked that question today and I was surprised, but they are. They're asking the, the sellers to, you know, sign a note. You know, and I, a lot of people think it's crazy to do that, but sometimes it's worth doing. You know, if they're trying to save their credit, uh, and, they get probably a very low interest rate, um, pay off that debt over time. I guess that's better than being stuck with the house. Or it might be better than having a foreclosure on their record or a bankruptcy and all those other good things that come along with this mess that has been made over the last couple of years. Another question I asked was the IRS. You know, when somebody pays their loan off for less than what's owed, they call that debt relief. You pay off that $300,000 loan with $200,000 short sale, there's $100,000 debt relief. The IRS would like to tax you on that as if you got income, right? And I know some of you are thinking, wait a second, that's not income. Well, it's money you don't have to pay back. It's debt relief, they call it. Now, in the 90s when this happened, and it didn't happen to this degree, the IRS looked the other way if they had a, a what they call the hardship letter. They had a letter explaining what happened and what the hardship that that borrower got in, um, and they didn't tax them on that debt relief. My friend on the inside thinks that that'll work again now. Um, it's bigger numbers, obviously, so it's even more important for someone to not have to pay tax on the debt relief. Uh, remember, I can't give you tax advice and I can't give you accounting advice, but I can give you opinion. Um, and this is just what's going on, all right? So just be aware of that. You, you know a little bit more about short sales now. You have a little bit of an update over the primary video on short sales. Um, a lot of you might say, hey, this just isn't for me, but I want you to just think about it. If it becomes a large part of your market and there becomes some opportunity there, you need to be ready. All right, you just need to be ready. Meanwhile, find one of the other 15, 16, 17 techniques that works for you. Get the volume that you're looking for. Start building your business, whether it's buying and selling, whether it's buying and holding or both. Um, but keep in mind the short sale may become back in play for you at some point. All right. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you on the next video.